All right, boys and girls, we are back with another edition of the Federalist Radio Hour. I'm your host, Ben Dominich. You can email us, as always, at radio at thefederalist.com. Follow us on Twitter at FDRLST. Hit the like and subscribe button on whichever platform you're watching this on. I'm happy to be joined today by culture editor at The Federalist, Emily Jashinsky, and also by senior editor at The Federalist, Chris Bedford. Emily and Chris, thanks so much for taking the time to sit down with me today. Good to be here, man. Yeah. Um, so we wanted to get together to talk about a couple of different things, but um, it's always it's always interesting to see what happens in this new environment in which Donald Trump is not on Twitter. And so when his pronouncements come, they take on a different form as opposed to kind of lurking in the background on a constant basis every day. Uh, you have to, in this in this case, kind of wait to see the lightning crash and then wait for the boom that echoes across the land. Uh, and this and in this environment, uh, I think that we have to talk about the beef that is formed between Donald Trump and Mitch McConnell, uh, which factored into a piece that Chris wrote for the site the other day uh, and that John Davidson has uh, up on the site today. John would be joining us, except he is in that terrible ice, you know, uh, and uh, and winter storm destroyed region of the nation known as Texas, and there uh, they have very little power and uh, and even less heat. Uh, so instead, we'll be talking uh, here today in the, from the confines of our our warm, power filled, electricity uh, thriving abodes. Uh, Chris, tell us a little bit about what your perspective is on Mitch McConnell after everything that went down with impeachment and particularly the speech that he gave and the follow-up Wall Street Journal interview that he gave uh, regarding his attitude toward former President Trump. Well, I mean, I lo- Mitch McConnell is an incredible myth maker about himself and his staff who are fanatically devoted are also very good at it. And during the four years of President Trump's administration, they, they, really, they were really incredibly successful at pushing this insane narrative that he's cocaine Mitch, the master statesman, the man who controls every single aspect. I mean, he is sort of certainly an old school Senate leader, the kind of one who does have a lot more control than an average Senate leader possibly usually would without earmarks and all the controls that they would otherwise have. But he's certainly not quite the emotionless mastermind that everyone always pushed him as. And we really saw that on full display on Friday after the collapse of his impeachment, how much his emotions have really gotten control over him. He started off with impeachment wanting to do it. And we know that, even though he didn't actually openly say it, because he orchestrated the piece to come out in the New York Times at the exact same time that Liz Cheney was coming out and saying that she was going to vote for impeachment. Now, this was supposed to be the moment six days after the riots at the Capitol on January. On, this was on January 12th, when the Republican conference would just push off Donald Trump off their backs and say, we had nothing to do with him. Ignore the last four years. We're back to doing what we always wanted to do. And it didn't quite happen that way. I mean, almost the entire Republican conference went in the House representatives went against Liz Cheney. And she was actually uh, she was attacked by her own party and got an incredible amount of votes against her. It was only saved at the end by Kevin McCarthy, maybe, uh, who who probably saw which way the winds were blowing on that one. And Mitch McConnell had actually moderate and liberal Republican senators coming out against him. And only the day before the impeachment vote did he say that he was going to vote to acquit Donald Trump. And he still went down and gave a murder-suicide speech, which was completely insane, attacking his colleagues, attacking his party, and attacking Donald Trump as being responsible even though he voted to acquit. Now, this didn't get him any credit with liberal media and didn't give him any credit with conservatives. He got something off of his chest, as Lindsey Graham said, but he put a load on everyone else's backs. And that's going to be something that's replayed over and over again in 2022, probably 2024, possibly 2026. As we go on and on, it's been a disaster. And Trump wasn't just sitting there tweeting, like you said. He was, he he, he might have been stewing. He might have been playing golf. He might not have been paying exact attention to the entire matter. But he came out this week, yesterday, with that uh, hysterically Trumpian statement. Even though it's on that official paper with the official seal of the 45th president of the United States, and he let everyone know what he thinks about Mitch McConnell. So so far, at least, despite what might have been expected. The moderate and the corporate wing, the left wing ring, wing really, of the Republican Party has suffered two pretty major and embarrassing defeats. And their responses so far have been simply to attack their colleagues and attack their conference. 
this is not going well for them with Donald Trump's departure. He's still around, it seems, and so are his ideas. Emily, uh, tell me a little bit about what you think was going into Mitch McConnell's approach to this, because as Chris laid out, it seemed like there was this brief moment where they thought they could get some momentum. And there was even some intimation from uh, people who I talked to on Capitol Hill that Mitch really was saying, you know, we've nearly got the votes. We, you know, he thinks he's almost there. Basically, that he thought he had, you know, double at least uh, the seven uh, Republicans who ultimately would vote to convict uh, 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 former President Trump. Uh, that to me is uh, an indication once again of McConnell kind of misreading his conference and not really understanding uh, where their incentives lie uh, for uh, for the different members there. What do you think was going into his strategy and his approach to this moment? Yeah, I think your, impo- your point about him misunderstanding the incentives at play is totally key to all of this. I think that's exactly right. He sort of had this idea that in, in the aftermath of January 6th and January 7th, I don't think it actually was just McConnell. I think there were some Republican senators on Capitol Hill who sort of actually forgot about where their incentives lie or maybe even thought that this sort of uh, base of the Republican Party would be so disgusted as they were with uh, the scene that day and with President President, then President Trump's role in it, that there would be some appetite for an impeachment um, and to, that would just sort of finally give them license to purge Trump and Trumpism from the Republican Party. And I really think in the heat of the moment on January 6th and 7th and the few days that followed, they felt like that was a real possibility. It was very exciting for them. It was sort of like, this is finally the justification we need to return to normal or to return to a party that Donald Trump is not the king of. And so I think that was really like, you can imagine for somebody like Mitch McConnell um, and for some senators, that that would be a really exciting prospect. Um, And, you know, I think what happened is after those few days sort of passed and the dust settled, they realized that, you know, there were other senators other than McConnell realized that there really was no public appetite or Republican base appetite for an impeachment. Um, And that's not to say a lot of people weren't upset in varying degrees about what Donald Trump did on January 6th, but but there was no real like incentive for senators to, uh, you know, cast their ballots or or vote yay in favor of an impeachment. And I think what's actually ended up happening, uh, and this actually sort of confirms the narrative that's emerging about Mitch McConnell, is there's now this reckoning. Um, And John's piece is a part of this. Uh, John Davidson's piece up on the Federalist this morning is a part of this, where he sort of runs down all of Mitch McConnell's bad candidate choices, where he chose someone like Leffler, where he chose somebody like even Tommy Thompson. I thought that was a great example that John sort of pulled out of the hat there. Um, And so what's- Hey, as a former Tommy staffer, I I, I actually, I concur (laughs) with John. (laughs) Unfortunately, that was not a good choice. Yes, no, no. And as it was, Scott, a night. Uh, I'm, yeah. say, I'm on the same page with that. And, and I just think Love like time. it's a great... <laughs> <laughs> There's now this reckoning about how Mitch McConnell has sort of been on the wrong side over and over again. Even in the statements that he gave to the Wall Street Journal just yesterday, he was complaining about the impact the Tea Party had on the GOP and sort of like his lamentations would have, you know, never allowed us to bring, it would never have allowed the conservative movement to elevate people like Ted Cruz and Marco Rubio and Mike Lee. Um, and so the, the whole, the like point is guys. that Right. No, but they're, they brought a lot, like they're sort of indisputably brought a lot of energy and a lot of momentum into the Republican party. So the point is that Mitch McConnell, um, had this like idea, has this idea of himself as being like shrewd. And that's a narrative that his staffers and he himself has sort of like pushed into the press. But actually what's happening right now is a reckoning with the fact that he isn't at all that like shrewd tactician, except for perhaps when it comes to confirming judges. And do you know what else the Tea Party did that's really messed up McConnell? Is McConnell probably in the old school before there were earmarks or when there were earmarks would have been able to rally an impeachment vote? I mean, that's why they're trying to bring them back right now because of the bribery and the power and the coercion that it allows. But all these outside money that pushes candidates takes a lot of part of money away or power away from the party and the earmarks being gone and having to do business more often in public or in omnibuses takes a lot of power away from the leaders. These these things make it so that he has to actually suffer defeats that he never would have had to suffer 15 years ago. That's a really think, good point. I think one of the elements, and that is true about the earmarks thing, um, I think one of the elements of this that we need to, 
to appreciate is McConnell um, is only the leader of the party in the Senate. He takes on this role occasionally where he acts as if he's the leader of the party. But obviously, you know, we know from poll data, I mean, the most recent YouGov poll, which came out uh, just last week, uh, you know, has McConnell at uh, upside down by like negative 15 points uh, compared to Trump being, you know, up through the roof in terms of uh, McConnell's approval is something is in the mid 30s and Trump's approval is uh, in the high 80s among Republicans. Uh, and so the point is, they listen to Trump, they don't listen to McConnell the same way. Um, that's fine. What McConnell is generally speaking to then is not the base, but to the donor base, uh, to uh, to K Street and to the corporate donors. And so he sometimes has to take on certain roles where uh, he plays the lightning rod or he, he takes on a, a slightly different stance than the rest of his conference. And he goes behind the scenes and allows certain people to vote certain ways and certain things. And that's all understandable. That's part of the role of leadership within the Senate. This was not one of those moments. This was not a moment where he was trying to sort of stake out something uh, so that uh, so that it would protect other members of the conference. Quite the opposite. Uh, as Chris noted, uh, quoting Lindsey Graham on Fox News Sunday, this is something that is going to be used in primaries against Republicans, used in generals against Republicans across the country. It's going to complicate a lot of, of elections uh, in ways that was that are, from my perspective, unnecessary. Um, and I think that that's something that is is going to have some ramifications. Now, of the senators who did vote the way that they did, you know, the only one who's up in this next cycle uh, is uh, Lisa Murkowski, who has her own kind of weirdness, given that Alaska is weird politically. Um, you know, she Alaska, won. you can say Alaska is weird. Uh, she won, she won uh, uh, in a write-in campaign, obviously, before, but uh, but there's a lot of different things that could happen there. I'm sure Donald Trump will want to play uh, in that election uh, to the extent that he can. Um, but Chris, I'm curious what you think is, is next in terms of the ramifications of this for McConnell, because, it, look, the guy is no spring chicken. He just won his most recent election. Uh, but they are in the minority, technically, with a 50-50 split and Kamala splitting things up. Uh, it, when it comes to the final votes, uh, the the immediate conversation around McConnell, I'm sure, is not going to be about replacement. But at some point, one of this next generation of of conservatives has to stand up and consider that they should be the next in line. Um, and I don't know what what moment that comes. It would be hard to do it if they take back the Senate in the midterms. Um, you know, uh, currently, I think Marco Rubio obviously is up for re-election, and so he's focused on that. Uh, but certainly, he's a name that people have talked about before as potentially being a Senate leader because he would potentially unite the centrist and the conservative factions uh, in a lot of ways. Many people, of course, uh, assume that John Cornyn is the leader in waiting, but I don't know that he's someone who can actually accomplish that. Do you think that McConnell is uh, basically firm in his job and, and has nothing to fear uh, from his conference? Uh, or is this a situation where, just given the way that he managed this, uh, given the way that he is viewed with increasing toxicity by people who support Donald Trump and, and, and are you know, strongly in his favor, that he is, is kind of on the, on the last stages of his leadership tenure? I think this was a massive blow to him, but with this, so early in the term and just before the midterms, well, I think it's going to become a subject for sure and a topic on the campaign trail for the first time in Mitch McConnell's career, really, at least in any kind of sizable way. I would be very surprised to see him actually lose power in the yeah. in the midterms. Uh, it sounds very unlikely, period. I mean, the thing the thing about it is Nancy Pelosi, John Boehner, People like that have been topics on the campaign trail before. Are you going to support them for speaker? Because they've actually started to suffer some. They've actually started to suffer some kind of rebellions and pushback and this and that, uh, and, and had a tumultuous career and become a target. Mitch McConnell's probably going to enter the conversation in that manner because Mitch McConnell's speech attacking the Donald Trump and attacking uh, those who basically acquitted him will be played on the campaign trail. Candidates are going to be asked about it, and it's going to be very tempting for them in any kind of Republican primary to say, I'm not voting for Mitch McConnell as majority leader when we retake the Senate, which, you know, they're all going to plan to retake the Senate. The map is looking very good for them to do so, although it's going to be certainly harder, given McConnell's speech, I think, to do so. 
Uh, but these things never quite play out as well, especially on the first round, as the base always wants them to. I mean, people have been trying to replace Nancy Pelosi for years. Uh, the rumors of her death have been greatly exaggerated. <laughs> Boehner has actually never taken down uh, until he stepped down. Paul Ryan retired despite some of his unpopularity in leadership. Uh, Mitch McConnell still has a lot of friends. And while a lot of people on the base might like Rand Paul or Ted Cruz, you know, their colleagues don't. <laughs> they don't yeah. actually have a huge amount of friends in the Senate. So who would actually step into that role? And, you know, this has been a conversation with Senate uh, – with friends of mine and contacts of mine in the Senate before multiple times of who's actually next when McConnell leaves. I mean, is it Cornyn? He certainly wants it. It's who's actually next. And not only who's next and who, who thinks they're next in line, which is a couple of people, but who can actually do it? Who can actually do this job, do, do it well, uh, get all of his colleagues behind him. And generally it's not going to be a firebrand. It's not going to be a Trumpist. It's going to be someone who gets along with a lot of people, can raise a lot of money and can move a lot of things. Uh, just generally play the kind of mastermind role that it generally takes. So, like I said, I, I, it's hard. To, it's hard to guess two years out who it's going to be after after McConnell, and it'd just be a guessing game. But I still think that if he goes for it, which he will, that he he will maintain it at least another another two terms. Yeah, the uh, I, I agree with you on all that. I think that one of the things that we need to uh, respect too about McConnell. Uh, and about Pelosi, uh, is that both of them are very effective fundraisers. Unlike Liz Cheney, who uh, was uh, ranked well. Uh, what does she? What does she do here? Yeah. <laughs> well, it's it's not just that her name is Liz Cheney; it's that she's on the Armed Services Committee, which is typically just you know a license to to get donor money. Uh, so the fact that she ranks near the bottom of the conference is kind of amazing when it comes to fundraising. Uh, if, if Liz Cheney was a good fundraiser, I don't think that any of the questions about her would have been anywhere near as significant. Um, the uh, Back to kind of the, the question about uh, Tea Party candidates that you brought up earlier, Bedford. One of the big things to me that is a flaw in, in uh, Mitch McConnell's rationale of the situation is that he's not really good at that. It'd be one thing if, if the approach that he had to picking candidates uh, actually paid dividends uh, and you had a bunch of these bank shot candidacies or let's pick this uh, you know businesswoman who's never run for office before because she can self-fund and that's going to help our other candidates and that kind of thing. It'd be one thing if that worked pretty consistently, but it doesn't. And in an environment where it doesn't, then you might as well run with people who have more ideological uh, you know, closeness to the base and can also excite people. I mean, you can talk as much as you want about the money that you spend on building a ground game. You know, we're going to reach out and touch, you know, X million Georgia voters, et cetera, uh, with our message. That's fine, but that can't replace passion for going out and actually voting for a candidate. Uh, so, uh, Emily, tell me a little bit about that side of things, because do you think that it, one of the, to me, it seems like that's the big uh, uh, hole in, in McConnell's armor. He can talk as much as he wants about his legacy when it comes to uh, the judiciary and to fighting for nominees, uh, to moving them through the process and, and things of that nature. But when he plays in the political space, um, the electoral space, it just seems to me like he he gets it wrong just as much as he gets it right. Well, there's a great quote from the journal article in which he provided comments where he says, I don't care what lane of the Republican Party a candidate is in. I care that they're electable. And to me, that's just like a disgusting representation of the swamp mentality, which is that like, it's not about principle at the end of the day, it's about power. And so Mitch McConnell can argue that increased power for the GOP will you know, make it a stronger vehicle for conservative agenda items. But that was not true when conservative Conservatives had the House, the Senate, and the presidency. Um, and largely, you can blame Mitch McConnell for not moving on some of those agenda items. And so they keep saying, we're going to move on sort of like these conservative agenda items. But then when they have power, what they show is that they really are primarily just concerned with power and with the sort of like benefits that they're focused on, which, you know, could include a tax cut bill or judges. Uh, but at the end of the day, when he says something like that, it also speaks to how poor his instincts are. Because if you look at Mo Brooks, if you 
you look at Doug Collins, um, Mitch McConnell wanted to shove a lobbyist like Luther Strange down Alabama's throat. He wanted to run with somebody like Kelly Leffler, um, who is a terrible candidate. Um, and on paper, I can see where somebody like Mitch McConnell sitting in his office in DC might say, she's a woman, she's really rich, she's good looking, throw her in there. She's the better option. Um, and so you could kind of see where like those instincts are just terrible. Uh, they're just, they're just terrible because they totally fundamentally misunderstood the populism that was informing the tea party that the conservative movement was telling the Republican party they needed to pay attention to in very key ways. And that Republicans like Mitch McConnell did not pay attention to. Um, and so it just, this, it's a misread of the base. It's a misread of the public and it's prioritizing power over just about everything else. You know, this reminds me that thing about a story Bob Dole used to tell as like an endearing story about Bob Dole and God bless Bob Dole. But he would see when he got back from World War II, they said, well, you sound like someone you seem like someone who, who should run for office in our area. And he, and he said, well, OK, uh, which party am I? I don't I've never thought about this. Who's 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 got the most votes in this county? And that's how he got his start in politics. And he told that as an endearing story. And it kind of is an endearing story, but it shows you exactly what his mindset was when he came to Washington, where, where it largely maintained and where a lot of people generally are. But we've seen throughout the throughout American history such an incredible decline in the power of parties. It's, mm -hmm. I mean, they used to have the convention where they controlled everything. I mean, then they, they, they got rid of the convention politics in most states and certainly federally, at least at the same level that they had. You know, you, you have these dreams and these stupid green room plots to like overthrow Donald Trump at the convention in 2016, but <laughs> they never come to fruition. They're so incredibly stupid. Uh, <laughs> and, and now you've got the outside money that's really coming in. So the Senate Majority Fund and Mitch McConnell's money, yeah, they, they can throw a lot around. But if you, take the, if you take the Senate Majority Fund on one side, and then you take the Senate Conservative Fund, and you take all the other little packs that will follow on that on the other side, no, you've actually got a firefight. They can't just decide who the candidate is. And the person who's the, that's going to go to the base at the end, the, the primary is going to win. And it's typically the, the person who wants to win in these primaries, at least in the states that can bear it, is going to be more to the right than to where McConnell is, at least in what they say, if not what they do when they get here. What was your favorite part of Trump's uh, 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 screed about McConnell, Chris? My favorite parts, <laughs> I think, were the outtakes. The bloopers yes. that never quite made it in. <laughs> yes. Reportedly, Donald Trump wanted to attack him for the number of chins that he had. <laughs> and so uh, this is what's different, though. This is what's different from what we get from Donald Trump now versus what we got on Twitter, because we definitely would have gotten the chin thing on Twitter. And it would have been immediate. There's multiple chins, you know, man jealous of my hair or whatever else I, he was going to say. I feel like I feel like I said this on TV at some point that like the future of negotiation between the two of them is Mitch McConnell coming out of the White House and giving sort of a, a normal Pablum politician speech in front of a microphone and then Trump just tweeting pictures of, of turtles at him all day for the rest <laughs> of the day. <laughs> um, the, they don't they don't the, like that at all. When I was at the when I was at the Daily Caller, we made a slideshow that was uncanny of pictures of turtles as Mitch McConnell. And this was like right at, right at the beginning of the meme. Like we'd put the, them side by side and it was really well done. His staff was so angry. Now they pretend that they liked it. But they, like, walking into Union Pub that night was a very unfriendly experience. <laughs> the, the funny thing about it is I, I think he looks more like a, like a Koopa Trooper. From uh, Mario than than he does a uh, uh, than he does a turtle. Um, uh, the of course uh, during all of this we learned that Joe Biden was dedicating himself uh, once again to the priorities of the American people and playing a lot of Mario Kart up at Camp David. Um, I'm in actually which he, happy he's doing that after having watched last night's town hall. Like don't yes. take the calls of the foreign leaders. Go play Mario Kart. Yes, it stimulates uh, the brain. <laughs> am I am I still the president? Yes, Joe. Yes, you are. <laughs> Wait, no, that was part of he that. He is when he's he like, looks at Jill and says, "Where are we? Where the hell are we?" <laughs> he <laughs> literally he said that. He was like, "I wake up, I wake up, I look at Jill every morning, and I just say, where the hell are we?'" <laughs> and he said that as an endearing thing. Again, like the the, the, the olds think this stuff is funny. <laughs> so, um, uh, uh, first off, I. 
I just think it's so on brand for him to play Luigi. It's just like this useless, tall person who's like not really good at anything. Like he doesn't help anything. I I think Luigi is a terrible driver, by the way, uh, within that um, uh, uh, within the, within the Mario Kart sphere, and not just because he's Italian. But, but he's <laughs> also just sort of like the. Were you a Bowser or were you a Yoshi or were you a Toad? He's Bowser. Uh, he's Bowser. I'm Toad. I play Toad all the time. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> I play against type. <laughs> I was between I was between Yoshi and Toad because Toad was fast, man, but I mean he had no checking power. He was going off that rainbow road like that. Yes. Yes. That's that's actually why I I, I, I said rainbow road because it's it's uh it's the one that is kind of a, a lot more difficult for Toad. But yeah, the the finesse play versus checking um, is is the way to go. Emily, Emily, what's your choice? Uh, <laughs> Luigi. <laughs> you actually play Luigi? I've never heard, I've never met anyone who played Luigi. Who does well, that? It's me. It's Joe, Joe Biden and me. Yeah. I don't well, think it's sort of like. Oh, I think you, it's sort of like you actually the, are the... too young to have played Mario Kart, aren't you? I'm not quite that young, believe it or not. <laughs> Um, no, I think Luigi's sort of like the facile alternative to Mario. Like, he's just the good guy, plain, um, but he's not as cliche as Mario. So I think I that explains why both Joe and myself are attracted to that option. <laughs> <laughs> I bought a Nintendo 64 for the old office and trying to be like the cool boss. And on the first day we played Mario Kart, Jeff Ingersoll uh, challenged anyone like and put money down or something that he was going to give out and they didn't have to pay if they could beat him. And it was such a crushing annihilation of everyone. And the next day we played Goldeneye, and it was like 20 to 0 to 0 to 0 every time with me playing. And on the third day I said, uh, all right, who wants to break from work early to play N64? And everyone pretended that they had work to do instead for the first time in their <laughs> lives. And no one ever played N64 with us again because we were the mean <laughs> old people who dominated them. <laughs> oh, my gosh. You had to bring in Smash Brothers to work out some uh, some, <laughs> uh, some inter-office uh, tension. So uh, back back to uh, uh, the context of the, of, of the day. This this You made reference to... Joe Biden um, playing Mario Kart while Kamala Harris is calling foreign leaders. This is something that actually happened. She was calling uh, Emmanuel Macron the other day, posted a picture about it. Uh, Macron posted a readout too. So typically, and I've asked several people about this, um, it's not that vice presidents don't do this. It's that they don't do it this early. Uh, they don't really interface with uh, other leaders of the G7 until you have any kind of, of uh, before you have any kind of face-to-face -face with them on the part of a new president. Uh, and so this is kind of, uh, you know, unprecedented times given the pandemic and the fact that you would have, you'll have less travel and things like that. But still, what does it say that Kamala's already asserting herself so much giving so many interviews, interacting so much with the media and with uh, people in a way that, that is very forward facing, even as Joe is getting these kind of sweet old, uh, uh, what, what I would describe as um, emeritus professor profiles, the kind of thing that you read in your uh, college paper about the sweet old professor who still teaches one class and stops at the at the coffee shop every morning and has the same tea and everyone says hi to him and he's just kind of a mascot for the campus you know white bristly disheveled hair isn't he so charming and wonderful he really adds to the atmosphere here and we can understand most of what he's trying to say to us about dante but really it's about the experience <laughs> like i mean that that to me is the the level of covered for getting of joe i find that disturbing as the commander in chief of the free of the you know of the greatest nation in the free world. So, uh, what what should we feel about that? I found his performance last night disturbing um, in the CNN town hall with Anderson Cooper because it's like painful to watch. It's not that he didn't get through it and you know it was fine, but the fact that like I mean he really does struggle um, to sort of like form his thoughts. It comes slowly. He loses track. He doesn't always make sense. And so it was one thing when that was happening on the campaign trail. And there's always that excuse that the campaign trail is just so exhausting and demanding that it would do it that to anyone, not let alone him. somebody. <laughs> 
<laughs> right, let alone somebody of his age. Well, right, the basement doesn't take that much out of you. Um, but at the same time, like you can sort of see why the Biden administration would want to nudge Kamala Harris into a more high profile and more active role early on, because honestly, Joe Biden does not sound good. And it's a different, for me, it was sort of a different kind of experience watching him st stumble through that town hall as the president of the United States, as opposed to the likely president of the United States. I, I mean, it just was sort of a stark reality. It, there's a, there's a tradition with vice presidents of making sure that you don't appear like you're trying to upstage your boss. I mean, granted, Selena like, Meyer, <laughs> <laughs> granted, like Richard Nixon, uh, probably didn't like kiss his wife on the cheek alone in their kitchen without thinking about the political ramifications of what he was doing and how it might change his future. And that really comes out in his memoirs, which he wrote a lot of, and they're worth reading. But he, uh, when he was vice president under Eisenhower, he was it was constant and painstaking what he had to what he felt like he had to do to make sure he wasn't trying to upstage Eisenhower, whether whether it was when he was abroad meeting with foreign leaders on behalf of the administration. Or, in, or even when Eisenhower had, a, had a, uh, a serious health attack and had to be hospitalized for a while, and the question actually came up of who's in charge, uh, he had to make sure that he, he established somewhat that there was not a break in control, that America was not in trouble. And keep in mind, this is during the Cold War. The Russians are watching this. This is actually a really dangerous moment for America. But at the same time, people were furious that he would even pick up the phone and talk to other members of the cabinet or try and talk to the National Security Council. How dare you, they would say, you know, Ike doesn't even like you kind of stuff. Uh, but, but Kamala Harris, I think I can, I'm just speaking for myself here, is an awful, awful human being, an absolutely horrible person, completely lacking in any social grace whatsoever. Uh, Have vicious, you not seen her shoes? By her husband. Not, like her ex-boyfriends don't even want her to run. She's such a, a horrible person. The, this, she's the kind of person who's going to very quickly and rapidly go for the throat on Joe. It wouldn't surprise me at all if she's winking and nodding, saying, I'm really the president, as you understand, or I'm going to be, so you better treat me like the president. I mean, she's like the kind of person where if they don't send a presidential limo and have the honor guard when she goes out and visits, I mean, she's just going to be an absolute nightmare for you. Of course, they would do that for the vice president of the United States anyways. But she's pushing this power. And at the same time as she's pushing this power, you know, she's, she's fortunately, in addition to being vicious, she's also like pretty stupid. So she's not going to be super good at it. And we're going to catch moments like this where she releases pictures and attacks Joe Manchin. She's not on, on the down low, but it's her husband that you should keep an eye on because he's the one who's actually pretty intelligent uh, so far it's, as it seems and is making money and is trying to give people access to the White House and is promising access to the White House. And also one more good thing, some silver lining to all of this is Kamala's viciousness, stupidness, and, and uh, ambition. She's probably not going to be spending that much time down at the U.S. Capitol, uh, where she is president of the U.S. Senate, where she should be basically ruling the Senate with an iron fist and making sure that the Biden agenda gets passed. She's probably going to be spending all of her time in the White House, you know, waiting for the old man to die so she can be the next queen. Uh, despite having never won a primary. And that's the kind of thing that actually will hurt an agenda. I mean, if you had a loyal soldier like Mike Pence, who many, some people have complained is loyal to a fault, not me, he would be down at that White House, at that Capitol, every single day getting the business done in the Senate. But instead, we're approaching 31 days of complete Democratic control and still no coronavirus relief, still basically nothing that's happened so far except for Trump still dominating American headlines. Mm -hmm. I know that uh, there's going to be a lot of, of uh, internal drama about the nature of the priorities of the Biden agenda, I think, here in the in the first 100 days. He didn't do anything, from my perspective, to settle any of those questions at the CNN town hall last night when it came to school reopenings, when it came to a number of other steps. Are we going to end up in a situation where basically at the end of 100 days, he's done a bunch of things to satisfy the woke progressives uh, that make up part of his base to address things and priorities that are important to liberal donors and the like, uh, but that we still are dealing with, you know, potentially a relief package that's stalled uh, and and very little that's actually going to go out and, and help the American working family. 
I mean, I think that's the case because we see already that they are struggling to meaningfully negotiate with the Senate and uh, with the Senate and with the Congress in general. And that was something that Joe Biden sort of pitched himself to the public as being capable of doing from his inaugural address to just last night. He really does pitch himself as a, a you know, a tactful sort of negotiator with the other side as a um, somebody capable of compromise and willing to compromise. Um, but it's not going well. And that's partially because they are pitching themselves as this um, unifying administration and doing so many things that are laughable um, and sort of immediately started, started implementing an agenda informed by the radical left wing of the party rather than the sort of like old school Biden wing of the party. And so it's, I think, causing them a lot of problems in um, being able to strike deals. So I, you know, I wouldn't be optimistic for that at all. Chris, uh, do you think the, that, what do you think that Republicans are going to do in the aftermath of all of this consternation about uh, in, internally about impeachment and about uh, the attitude towards former President Trump? Uh, what, what kind of stances do you think that they're going to take? What kind of fights are they going to try to rustle up uh, with uh, either Democrats on the other side or internally with uh, with McConnell or with other uh, members of leadership, Liz Cheney and the like, who, with whom they've had issue? My gosh, I'm not, I expect nothing uh, from the Republican conference there. So incredibly disappointing. I mean, just the fact that they actually did manage to walk and chew gum at the same time as Chuck Schumer kept on saying they could do, and they actually managed to just sweep through without even a single problem, con a nomination after nomination after nomination of the Biden administration, despite all of the questions that you could have been asking them. I mean, about their role with private business, about their role with Hunter Biden, about their, their willingness to investigate this administration, about abortion, about the other things that they're going to be pushing, about the U.S. foreign, uh, US foreign uh, impact that, that our policy has, about banking. I mean, there's so many questions, just basic questions and news cycles that should have existed around every single one of these candidates. And instead, you have the Republican Party just saying, well, you know, we're waiting until Joe Biden really passes the crazy ones before we actually stand up and fight. And it's like, why not? Why, why are you doing that? Well, if you actually stand for anything, it's, it's really easy for you. You're two years from re-election. This is where you make your name. Why don't you fight on every single thing? I mean, the, the, the Democrats fought on, on putting Mattis in, in office, basically the least controversial of any single one of Donald Trump's uh, nominations. And Donald Trump's early nominations, a lot of them didn't really work out for him because a lot of them weren't at all uh, alongside his agenda. We're probably the least controversial people that he put up the entire four years he was in office. But every single one of them, uh, even with re uh, Republican control of the U.S. Senate, was a referendum and a reminder of how evil Donald Trump is. A, a referendum on the Republican Party, a referendum on the horrible racists and the Nazis and everything. Every single one of them. Meanwhile, the Republicans have been completely trampled. And you don't even have to actually do hard things when you're in the minority. You can just shake your fist and say, when we get in power, we're going to get rid of Obamacare. And you can do that again and again and again. <laughs> and people will still vote for you, even though it's BS. Uh, and they're still not doing that. Like, this is easy, easy stuff. Uh, all that's to say that if it wasn't for the Democratic Party, uh, I wouldn't be even ever voted for a Republican because, <laughs> gosh, they are such a bad, bad party. It is kind of funny that at the end of the day, the most controversial moment ended up being uh, uh, when Senator Kennedy had to point out that he didn't call Bernie Sanders an ignorant slut. Um, <laughs> that was good television. I, and I, yeah. do love, I do love Senator Kennedy. That man... Whenever, whenever he comes on screen, I, I, I shout, wait, he's going to reference a rodent. He's going to reference an animal. <laughs> and, <laughs> and he always does. Um, so uh, before we go out, let's, let's uh, sort of wrap this up with, um, with a forward-looking conversation about the Republican Party. Uh, McConnell, along with every other major member of leadership uh, on the Democratic side, including, of course, uh, Schumer and Durbin, and then of course on the on the House side, uh, Pelosi, uh, Hoyer, and uh, uh, Clyburn. Uh, in addition to Joe Biden himself, uh, they're all in their late seventies and early eighties. So you know they will presumably be replaced, uh, not immediately, but within the next couple of twenty cycles. years or so. Yeah, exactly. Um, 
the, so th that to me is going to raise a lot of different questions about where we go from here. Uh, the the criticism for the people who've made up this current leadership is that basically they haven't used the power when they've had it. If they're Republicans, or they've used it the wrong way, tax cuts and judges, as, as Emily said, um, the uh, and and not in terms of, of advancing uh, legislation that could have uh, more staying power. Um, do you think that what we're going to end up with is a more broken? Uh, experience in terms of the Congress going forward when they are inevitably replaced uh, that where you know let's say the, the the more hype machine kind of focus members are actually the ones who end up taking over or do you think that if you actually step away from this generation that's holding on to power that's held it on to it for so long that we can actually see these institutions potentially reform themselves and maybe get back you know, not fully to the way they're supposed to work, but maybe to the way that they worked uh, before the most recent, you know, 10, 15 years or so when they, when pretty much everybody agrees they've been pretty broken. That's Emily, hard for, so I think it's, it's, I think that actually the cultural issues are central to that question. Um, so I think it depends on how sort of like the Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez wing of the Democratic Party evolves and how that sort of right flank of the Republican Party, the right sort of like Trump loyalist wing of the Republican Party evolves. Because frankly, I don't think most conservatives would want that right flank working with Democrats at all on a lot of these cultural issues. And so if you have that like discord and that utter incompatibility um, that, you know, if, if the left continues to insist on this sort of cultural radicalism and it's slow creep, not slow, actually, it's, it's rapid takeover of all of our institutions, then there's not going to be much for anybody to agree on, period, ever, except for, you know, if you have these sort of like neoliberal Republicans and then the, the neoliberal Democrats coming together. And so I guess it's, to me, the how sort of the scope of that <laughs> neoliberalism in both parties parties really depends on what continues to happen in the culture war and how um, I like don't really see any end in sight to this sort of like institutional takeover by the hard left. And I think, you know, if that continues, I'm not sure how much room there is to work on, you know, together period or to sort of like function like a well-oiled machine. Uh, I just don't see how that's possible. And there's a problem here where you have this, you have, if you're a competent conservative, then they really hate you. I mean, they'll say say what people say, attack the House Freedom Caucus, for example, over and over again, saying you guys just like the grandstand, but you move the poll. That's BS. The amount of legislative accomplishments and push and forward pushes that the House Freedom Caucus is responsible for is impressive. But if you see these new members who are coming in, the Madison Cawthorns, et cetera, who brag about how they have more communication staffers and policy staffers, well, that's incredibly stupid. Uh, because I think you're actually here to win battles and not get Instagram likes, bro. The the uh, that's a feeling that's coming out more and more and more among some of the elected people who seem like they're on the right. They're more interested in being, you know, media stars. And you see that not just on the right, but sometimes with Crenshaw, for example. Uh, you see that all all over the Republican conference and even some of the Democratic conference. You see that from AOC, uh, uh, for example. But if you're an ineffective winger like those guys are or leftists, then they don't have to worry about you running the party. And if you're an efficient winger like Jim Jordan, maybe, or Mike Lee, you're not going to get in charge of the party either because they hate you for different reasons uh, here in Washington, <laughs> D.C. It, all of that bodes for like kind of just a milk toast kind of person who's actually good at administrating and raising money coming in and typically leading these parties. Otherwise, you're just going to get chaos. Which confirms what you said about Marco Rubio, um, and, and I like Marco Rubio a lot, but what you just sort of laid out is exactly a description of Marco Rubio, and as a preview of kind of what we're talking about just briefly, I think this sort of dust-ups that we've seen between Ted Cruz and Alexandria, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez are just a perfect example of why I'm totally pessimistic about any sort of like room for um, legislative success between both parties where they would have to work together is because every time some Republican says they agree with like a populist 
populist piece of legislation or a proposal from AOC or even a sentiment from AOC or somebody else in the far left wing, be it Bernie Sanders, whomever, they just sort of get piled on and AOC or Bernie claps back at them. And it's not because of the policy agree. It's not because they have these like policy disagreements. They actually do agree on the policy. It's for cultural reasons. You know, they, they'll sort of find some sort of cultural for the social excuse. No. Yeah, a hundred percent. Yes, this is the great irony at the end of the day uh, is is that Matt Gates and Adam Kinzinger have more in common than they have a <laughs> different. <laughs> you're the same person. You're just on the other side. <laughs> you are me. I am you. <laughs> right now. Um, uh, thank you so much, uh, Chris and Emily, for sharing your insights uh, today. You've been listening to another edition of the Federalist Radio Hour. I'm your host, Ben Dominic. We'll be back soon with more. Until then, be lovers of freedom and anxious for the fray.